Our uh, thing is we've been in the lawn care business for two years now. This we, Last year was the completion of our second year, going into our third year, and we're loving it. So this is Ed Wright, uh, the CEO of Wright Manufacturing Incorporated. And I'm going to let him introduce himself and tell you guys a little bit about him. I know you already know about him, but now maybe you might learn something new about him. Take it sure. away. So I'm Ed Wright. I'm the CEO of Wright Mowers. Um, I somewhat grew up in the business, and um, so I, my background in the business is from the product development side of things, working on new products and product support, and, um, and more recently took the reins of the business on. So I guess that's a little bit about me. You had some different photos of different things going on there. Um, two years ago, I became a small pilot, which was a fun thing to do. You had a couple pictures of that, and um, recently just had my fifth child right before Christmas, and so... Um, Five. It's been, it's been fun. Yep. Oh, yep. oh my goodness. That, <laughs> that I would have been driven totally crazy. Not, <laughs> not crazy enough as it is, but five is a lot. <laughs> well, this fifth one, she's a good baby. She's, she's, oh, she's almost, I mean, awesome. she wakes up once maybe during the night and she sleeps really well and that kind of thing. That, that makes all the difference. Well, you came from a big family yourself, so you're making a big family. Yeah, maybe not quite as big, but yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So how many brothers and sisters did you have? We've got nine brothers and sisters. Nine. Oh. <laughs> yep. Ten kids total. Yep. God bless. God bless your mom. Hey, I had six. I didn't grow up with all of those, but I did have six. Okay. Yeah. It was fun. Uh, siblings. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So uh, anything else, Ed? Anything else you want people to know about you? Um. I mean, it'll probably kind of be woven in, but did you you wanted uh, to talk a little bit about kind of the history of the company or kind of how we formed to be where we are today, not like that. I thought we'd start off with with the origins. I know that your dad started a uh, a lawn company way back when in the '70s, I think. Yep. Uh, called Lawn Right. Yep. Right. Yep. He started out with a couple of employees, or yep. he started out by himself. Then he realized, hey, I got to work a full time job, so I got to hire some guys to do this for me. Exactly. So we did that. The, he, the, when he started the business, it was a little different than what oftentimes, you know, kind of precipitate. He was working as an auto mechanic at the time, and my uncle started cutting the grass, and he was doing bidding, bidding work, doing the maintenance on the mowers, that kind of thing part-time. And he was running that landscape company. I want to say it was about two years um, before he started cutting himself. And that was probably around 81 um, where they got that going. And then around the mid 80s, 84, 85, 86, they started making um, accessories. So we have got the, the Valky, it's a little wheel that you put behind, walk behind mower. Yeah. And that was, you know, to help uh, their crews become more productive originally. And eventually that um, became a product they were selling back to the dealers. We had the steel grass catcher, the gobbler, They'll make that today. Um, that's our test business. And then also somewhere in that time period, they um, started Clip. It was a billing route, routing and scheduling software uh, for landscape companies. Um, for many years now, that's been a separate, separately run company, um, as well as LawnRight. So LawnRight, they sold in the mid-90s. And that accessory business, so we got into welding and painting and that kind of thing in the mid-80s. Uh -huh. And... Um, I mean, if you think of the Valky, it's a little wheel behind a hydro walk behind. Um, back then, we ran all skag, grip, uh, walk behind. Well, originally, transoms and then switched to, uh, to uh, skag hydro, they came out. And um, it seemed a natural progression at some level to move that wheel, standing on that wheel, right onto the scene. So, our, our first prototype was a um, skag chopped up with the platform between the wheels. And uh, they patented that concept and uh, went into production with it. It took some years to kind of get the business going. And actually, in the early years, um, we were in a patent lawsuit around that with somebody else making a different version of it. So it was, uh, it was a number of years of just you know, scraping it together. And then moving into the 2000s, we started picking up a little bit more momentum. And every year since then, it's just a uh, <laughs> So, so this clip that you're talking about, yeah. I, I don't remember reading about that. Was that 
was that a nut was that outside the the business or was that your dad did that for the business originally it was you say he sold it off or originally it was for the business and then as soon as it started working my uncle who was working for it at the time did a lot did a lot of that software development and eventually bought that business out and um it still exists today so there there's different versions of it there's an online version mobile features and whatnot and there's also a version that uh connects to quickbooks so you can do your customer management your building um, but yeah it's specifically designed for landscape contractors uh, to do billing scheduling routing hmm. look them up so that's that's an independent company they're just successfully uh forty thousands of landscapers today yep. so wow. central power equipment and okc loves selling right mowers yeah our best-selling brands what do you have to say to that <laughs> good good <laughs> central power equipment I think they're the ones that loaned uh, Stetson his his uh, right demo yeah, okay. when he first did it. I think they're the guys. Okay. So I need to get I need to get with Judas this year and get me a get me a demo. So we got we got some questions starting to come up, and I thought we'll continue to talk about it because I do have more questions uh, regarding you specifically because you're you're different than the other CEOs of the other. Uh, companies, uh, not just in the mower business, but in a lot of businesses. You're one of those CEOs that, that just gets down in the weeds. And I want to ask you about that after this Cato question. It says, Ed, what are your intentions to being so active? Well, there you go. So active yeah. social media platforms. It would seem you're the only CEO of a mower manufacturer that's extremely active. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that it's really, really important that the leadership of our business really deeply understands their customers, what they want, what they're doing, and actually enjoys their company, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and I think I've intentionally kind of positioned myself there. And so my intentions of being so active on social media, you know, it's, I put the time I can into it, and there's always more I could do. So there's a lot of questions that go unanswered, kind of thing. But I try to stop by regularly and stay in touch with what's going on. I, I think it's really important that we understand what's going on in the community. Um, but at the same time, it helps other people understand who we are, what we're trying to do and that kind of thing. So there, there, there's both directions. We've done some very scripted type marketing kind of stuff and I just really didn't feel like it represented the spirit of what we're trying to do. And I just felt like um, more of social content is much more valuable than what I'm doing at YouTube, whatever. And by doing it myself, I feel like um, that message comes through you know more succinctly than you know through through a filter of um you know the production side of marketing <laughs> so exactly right because if you're yourself people will be drawn to you mm -hmm. right yep. yeah well the thing the thing that i like about it is i like a guy that stands behind his product and you're out there man if i got a problem with your product i come down to the gie next year and talk to you about it personally yes yeah. mm -hmm. right you know what i mean and there's a lot of people who do that, so yeah. And, and, and you put yourself out there on Instagram and social media. I've when I sent you my my message on Instagram asking you if you'd be on this show. I honestly I didn't really expect a response, but you responded like within an hour. I was cool. I was amazed. I was amazed by it. Yeah. You know, I'm a nobody. Uh, we're 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 a very small lawn care company, and I was talking to my wife earlier today, and I said, you know. Ed very easily could have said, you know, thank you very much for the invite, but I'm kind of waiting from one from one of those big boys that have like ninety thousand. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, you, and you'll probably get one now, but <laughs> well, you know. So here's the reality, okay? So, so many of our customers are repeat repeat purchasers, right? So out of the thousands and thousands of mowers we sell, put my hands here. Out of the thousands and thousands of mowers we sell, the number of owners is some number like this. And there's a lot of loyalty repurchasing, that kind of thing. And there's a lot of our users that that we know and we've known for many years. And um, the world is actually a pretty small world. And I think that contact and that relationship is extremely important. I you know my kind of my philosophy that kind of expands out of this a little bit is is kind of a, a history lesson. I love history. There, Okay, so hold on. Get in my soapbox for a minute. So, 
I think if you go back to the early days of when there was a general store in a small town and the proprietor brought the products in and the reputation was there. They showed up the business every day. He bought you know, from them because they knew who they were. If the product was no good, they'd say, this is no good. We need to deal with this. Their customers complained about the product on the, you know, the stoop or at the pitching post. And there was that, that tied in aspect of the business, right? The owner, proprietor, and support, it was all one function right there. All right, so then we got into uh, the early ages of mass production and companies became more centralized and bigger and it was no longer like a blacksmith making the plow that a particular farmer was asking for. We're just gonna make tons of plows, we're gonna ship them all out over the country. And if somebody has an issue, we got a warranty statement that you know says, hey, we're gonna stand behind it and you can take it to court if we don't, right? So now we're starting to use a legal instrument. We're starting to separate sales from marketing, from product development, from production and quality. Um, the, the ownership accountability aspect of it, all that gets diluted. And uh, that was that was the industrial era of, you know, better living through chemistry, sort of post-war production, 60s, 70s, everybody owned tons of manufactured products. Um, and then we had like um, Sears and Roebuck and Company, right? So there, that's where sort of this shipping product started coming into into play. Um, you could get anything mail order. Then we got into the early '90s, and that's when the internet hit the scene, and people started going to less trade shows. You could go online and search a product and find out sort of spec sheet type information about it. And so the internet started becoming part of the equation of how companies were representing and selling across distances. Then the owner of the internet became social on it. So companies started becoming accountable to their customers, giving them star reviews and ratings and um, maybe complaining about particular issues that they had with their product. This had to be dealt with. And their customers were spending time at this to, to uh, talk about. So now having a warranty statement today is less important than this previous industrial era. And a uh, personal standing behind your product is now more important. And so the social internet now means that, well, let's, let's look at a few examples, okay? Steve Jobs, he's somebody who had a very clear vision for his product, for his company, and he was out there to say what it was and he was there to work with his teams to, to specifically create that product and bring it to reality, right? Mm -hmm. The visionary on the front line. Um, I think another contemporary is Elon Musk. So, you know, he's a little bit of a wild character and has some kind of spastic management practices, but you have to give him credit for being a visionary, being on the front lines. He's engaged in social media at some level, you know, like um, the, the car review company, they reviewed their cars and said, hey, look, they're Stopping distance doesn't match with their advertising. What's up with this? And they rated him really poorly on that, whatever. And Elon, Elon reached out on, on social media and said, hey, we recognize this issue. We're going to fix it right away. And like two weeks later, they sent an update over there to all their customers to uh, change the, the stopping algorithm, right? Yeah, so these are, these are leaders of companies that are on the street. They're passionate about their product and making it happen. And I think in today's world and the social internet, you've got to put yourself out there. Um, in, in a in a way that is very interested in your product and interested in your customers' interaction with your product. That that function is vitally important, and you can't um, remove yourself, you know, arm's length from it. And yeah. um, so that's I think that's that's kind of how I've seen history, and part of what's happening with social media and my involvement in it is that if um, if I'm not there to look after what our customers are saying about our products, then I'm not going to be providing the leadership within our business to address those issues. Um, that's really awesome. Yeah. That, that you well, can't not be successful in this day and age and, and not address the social media well, aspect. Right. Yeah. You have to. I, I think I think there's a lot of companies out there right now that are kind of ignoring it. And I think to their disadvantage. To their detriment. Yeah. Maybe not right now, but as we as we're moving forward. More and more, I hardly ever watch TV anymore, to be honest. Oh, yeah. yeah you know? I don't either. And if something breaks in my house, 
uh, I go to YouTube to figure out how to fix it. This man, I'll tell you, he was not handy at all. Thanks, Karen. I appreciate and that. And then um, he started building his own computers. Yeah. Yep. And when he started getting involved in YouTube, that's when he started looking up all kinds yeah. of things yeah. on how to fix stuff. It, it was like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm finally married to a well, handyman. man. Yeah. <laughs> because of YouTube, I've been able to fix a lot of things that are broken that would have that would have cost a lot, a lot of money, a right? A lot of money. I didn't yeah. have the training that growing up, you know. My dad was a pilot in the Air Force, so he was gone most of the time. Uh, so I didn't have that kind of a background growing up. But now I can go to YouTube and I can watch a guy tell me how to fix a dishwasher. Yeah. You know I mean? And yeah. and here's here's where here's where it really gets important. When I first started thinking about this lawn care business. I'm like, I don't even know what I need. I don't know. Do I need a, you know, do I need a sit down mower? Do I need a standard yep. mower? Do I need a walk behind? What do I need? So I got on YouTube, right? And exactly. I started watching all of these videos. Well, in the very first year he started doing it, he used his John Deere mower. <laughs> yep. Wow. <laughs> that was, you know, for Wait, our it. household. Yeah. we. Yeah, yeah, it's very small. Very small. But. but but the point is, is that when I wanted to 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 get into this, YouTube's where I where I went, right? Yeah. And and I started, you know, literally Googled zero turn mower mower or not mm -hmm. Google, but YouTube searched it, and then I watched a bunch of videos about zero turn mowers, and I kind of, you know, you, it's human nature. You kind of there's YouTubers out there that you're gonna like identify with. Yep. And they're like, man, that guy's a lot like me, so I'm going to watch him, right? Mm -hmm. His tastes are a lot like me, or he likes the things that I like and doesn't like the... So I start, you know, you, you automatically gravitate to those people. Mm -hmm. And because you do that, then you give the equipment that they're using a little bit more consideration. That's right, yep. So I think that you're, it's brilliant what you're doing, getting your toe in, and there's other companies out there that don't even have a social media program at all. Right. I, I understand it at some level, though, because it's big company problems, you know, a big, you know, a Ford Motor Company or whatever. You know, the, the things that people represent online, their own employees would say and whatnot. It's hard to understand. Um, how, how do you legally hand those, handle those issues? And I don't I don't know. I don't have the answer. Um, I mean, Elon, Elon Musk puts his neck out there and every now and then he gets, gets it chopped off. But um, I don't think he cares, though. Honestly, I don't think he cares. I think last time it cost him what twenty million dollars or million dollars, whatever it was. I don't think he cares. I don't know. You know what I mean? It just doesn't does. like too much affects him. Yeah. That's and maybe that's part of his genius, though. You know what I mean? He doesn't mm -hmm. let other people influence him. So who knows? Well, I think the other part is it's not just a strategy. I I, I do enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I was going to ask you. Did it start out because it was like a business decision or did you start out because, man, it's kind of cool talking to my customers? So the reality is how it started. And this was sort of. It was before Instagram existed and, and Facebook was kind of just incubating. Um, you know, our website was very cumbersome to update and it seemed like our product information was getting out kind of slows molasses and. Um, annual brochures. I mean, that, that just didn't address the products that we're bringing to market. And I was in product development at the time. And um, we were saying, okay, how can we fix this problem as quickly as possible? And a marketing company we're working with at the time um, helped us run a series of videos. We thought that 50 seconds was the thing. It was before kind of the YouTube environment had really settled what it was for. Um, turned out 60 seconds was not very helpful and scripted content wasn't very helpful. And so we just started creating videos and we watched what, what did people watch? Where do we get the retention? And we worked to just deliver more and more of that, you know, and a lot of it drove us to technical material. So one of the videos that's produced the most minutes watched is 30 minutes of kind of very technical stuff about hydro systems. When do you give up on that mower versus keep repairing it and answering those kinds of questions. And that's that's what the um, that's what the retention numbers told us people wanted. So we continue to produce, produce it. So that's that's kind of how I started. And then it kind of picked up speed. This past year, I've really fallen off the wagon. I mean, what <laughs> what I've put up, I'm not that proud of. It's been, hey, I had 
10 minutes and I was in the airport. So I, you know, recorded something and posted it without editing. So um, hopefully we can get back on that. And um, we've actually added some help. So I hope you'll see a lot more of uh, more of us. So it looks like your company's growing over the last couple of years. I mean, it looks like you're getting, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, which, well, we, which leads into this question from Gary Cecil uh, Garrison. He's asking, are more dealers uh, becoming more interested? His closest is 74 miles away. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. We're working on dealer density to you know bring in dealers where there's voids of nothing going on. And um, so we, we've been growing phenomenally. I've, since we moved into this building in 2000, I uh, want to say we're producing 10 times as many mowers. And uh, Did you say yeah. 10 times as many? That's yep. amazing. Just in a couple of years. Yep. Wow. It's, been, it's been phenomenal. We can barely keep the wheels on it. That's great. No wonder you're smiling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> smiling, too. So the answer is yes. Yes. Uh, more dealers coming. Uh, Gary, where are you at? Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe Ed's got some in inside information for you if you tell us where you're at. Billy Goat wants to know what was the deal with the John Deere and the Great Dane using your stand-up design. I know sure. there's some controversy with that. Well, there's a couple different rounds of it. One is a fellow by the name of Dane Skag. Um, I believe he was like a nuclear physicist or something like this. And he had bought Bobcat, which was orange at the time. And or he bought or created, I don't know, he was involved with, with running Bobcat uh, way back in the day. And he sold that. And then I believe some years later, when a guy by the name of Joe Berrios came out with this patent around dual hydros, uh, Dane Skag created another company with Metalcraft of Mayville and created Skag Power Equipment. And that originally started around right when the dual hydro thing hit the, hit the market. And they've been very successful with that ever since. And then he retired again. And when the stand-on concept became a thing, you know, he, he saw that patent come through. He created a, another company called Great Dane Power Equipment, out of a canary yellow machine. And uh, he worked with a company, I think it was called Hunselman, that, that built it. So both Gag and, and uh, Great Dane, he didn't create the manufacturing company out uh, front. He worked with a fabricator and he did the design and marketing. So he created Great Dane. They, they really hit the market quick, way faster than we could, or we had the funding to. Mm -hmm. And um, we ended up with a patent dispute with him and eventually settled in our favor. And right after that settlement, he sold it to John Deere. And John Deere subsequently made their original stand on mower. So the original one, the platform was way far in front of the wheels. It's kind of a front heavy machine. Mm -hmm. And um, it didn't really get that far. There was four or five different brands that were selling different variants of that in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then um, around 2012, 2013, uh, we were in agreement with John Deere to contract manufacturer stand on mowers. Um, so we did that for a couple of years and eventually walked away from that. Um, we found that was interfering with our ability to serve our, our branded customers at the level that we wanted to and kind of diluting the focus that that was core to who we were. And so there was a couple of years where they were selling something that's like our Gen 1 Standard X. Mm -hmm. um, they continue to build something like our 212, 2012 edition machine uh, today. So there's there's a couple of different products out there. Okay. I hope that answered Bill, Billy Goat's question. Uh, I, it answered it for me. I, yeah. I, I had saw that there's some controversy on that issue, but there's not much information floating around the interweb. No, there isn't. Uh, no. Probably for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> Jason wants you to know that he really uh, wishes more ma mower manufacturers had the enthusiasm for the stuff they build like you do, Ed. Thanks, Jason. I've always been impressed with them, with you as a business owner. So there you go. Pretty high play, praise. So... Let's see what we got going on here. Let's see if there's any more questions out here. If not, I wanted to, I also wanted to ask you, uh, now you're not like the typical guy that takes over a business uh, it, from, his, from his dad. You worked your way up through that business. You started a fairly, you know, and then you got your degree. Yeah. Could you run us through? how you went up through the, the ranks in the business. And by the way, that is very impressive. Most guys 
or gals would just go, want to be up at the vice president level yep. and that, not know a thing. That would have been me. I would have been like, I don't want to hear anything <laughs> about it until you make me the president. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then we'll talk about it. No. We well, I mean, I think it's a mix of things of, you know, I had great, great opportunity, but I've also worked at it hard. And um, I think it started as, as a young kid, we made hardware kits, you know, for five cents a baggie in our basement kind of a thing. We were making just gobblers. And through high school, I worked summers, uh, did a couple different things, did um, welding, belt sanding parts that came off, band saws, that, that kind of stuff. Um, Created mowers, did run in, so the, you know, putting the oil gas machine, making sure it goes straight, that kind of stuff. I did that for a summer. And then I studied uh, mechanical engineering um, and numerical methods, so kind of the using math to solve optimized problems. Um, You're way smarter than me. There's no way. I hate math. <laughs> well, I hated math. I, I went into engineering thinking I, if I survive this, I'll be doing good. And I, but the thing is, when I started, working on the engineering study, saw the relevant applied math become, became a lot more helpful to me. Um, I think it's like anything else because I, I was terrible at math when I was in school, but now my job, my 40 hour a work week job, that's not lawn care, depends on math entirely. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, when, you see, when you see the application of the, of the solution of the, of the math, mm-hmm. and it makes sense to you, then it becomes easy. Yep. I was frustrated when I didn't have a use for it. And, you know, exactly right. yeah. So I studied mechanical en- mechanical engineering. When I got out of college, um, I got involved here in doing some product design stuff and worked at that for a number of years. And um, eventually that involved uh, leading a couple design projects on new mowers. Uh, one of the first products I designed was our standard RH. Um, it was a really big seller for us at the time when it came out with it. Now looking back, it's kind of an awkward machine. It had an adjustable deck, but it didn't float. But we were trying to make a 36 commercial machine. Um, so I got involved in product development and then product marketing and the, the support and warranty side of things. Um, and always pretty involved in you know, how our mowers were made in manufacturing. And um, you know, this past year took on the role of uh, CEO and um, decided to kind of be bringing the, the company forward into the next generation and um, it's been fun and a lot of people have supported me. It's been, it's actually been kind of a hard year, but um, huge amount of support, a lot of success, a lot of good people that, that uh, surround us and what we're doing. We have a great team here. Yeah, you became the CEO like January, around January 25th of last year. So you're, yep. you're coming up on a year of being the man the, that's right one year is it that's so cool how's it do you see the company different now that you're in that position uh rather than when you were an engineer with yep. the company and, and I, can, you, can you talk about that a little bit i think before i felt like i was a contributor and now i feel responsibility so there's an aspect of feeling the, the weight of the world on my shoulders um but you have a lot of people to be responsible it. for too don't you how many people you got working for right uh, we're somewhere around 150. Something like that. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So cool. That's that's a huge <laughs> that's a huge responsibility. Yeah. I got my business administration degree way back okay. in 2004, okay. so I'm very interested. She's not looking for a job. No, I'm not. But if How I do move to Maryland. <laughs> it's interesting though. Yeah. Who's your daddy has a question, and I don't know if there's an answer to that. He says. Uh, is there a good stand-on mower that's good for people with backs? A stand-on mower good for people with bad backs? Yeah, so oftentimes it can be. It has It's unique to kind of what the issue with your back might be. Um, but if you're standing straight, typically that's going to be a lot better for your back. And, you know, the, the latest and greatest stand-on mowers have nice suspension in the platform. And so it's a much healthier position to be in versus kind of hunched over a seat. Reality is when you're sitting on a mower – you tend not to lean back in the seat because the, the back of the seat will like kind of whack you. Mm-hmm. And um, that's, so you send up hunched over and you know, whatever. So generally stand on mowers are going to be a lot better for your back. So we're kind of a typical back issue. Yeah. I know, I know after uh, we, we cut some huge acres that we have to do to sit down because I don't have a wide enough standard to do them yet. 
but I know at the end of that, at the end of those days, my back's killing me. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, whereas if I spent all day on a on a stander, my legs may be a little tired, but my back's not killing me. Yep. I got back problems anyway. So uh, let's see. So there you go. Who's your daddy landscaping? Uh, oh, here we go. Arrow Valley Landscaping. Uh, he want, He's looking for a demo of a ZK. He currently runs Ferris, but he wants to try the right. Yeah. My understanding is that you can get on your website. Maybe you can talk us through this. Yep. Contact Judith. Ross. Yep. yep. Can, can you talk us through it? You can reach out to Judith Ross. It's probably easier if you go on her website uh, because with the amount of travel that she does, she, has, she can't administrate everything that comes through. But if you go on our website and request a demo, we'd be glad to see what we can do to get you set up. Um, and to be honest, um, the demo environment has changed the past couple of years. With the amount of people that are reviewing mowers on YouTube, yeah. a lot of people expect that, hey, I get to have a demo for a week, uh, you know, starting tomorrow. And the reality is that's oftentimes not the case. That's the case when, you know, a more visible YouTuber has to brand the demo more. Uh, but we'll do our best to try to get you a demo as soon as possible, as long as possible. In the, in the middle of spring, there's not enough demos to keep the machine for a week. Um, but depending on the circumstances, maybe a day or, you know, if the demo is booked constantly, uh, you might get a couple hours with it. So it's, it's really depending on where you are and where we are in the season. But we'll do our best to get you a demo and, and give you the, the uh, sense of how the machine runs. Gives you the level of confidence to know that it's for you or not. Well, you can definitely demo the video, the, any of the machines at the GIE. Currently. Well, that's yeah. not, you can you can ride them around, but I mean it is called a demo, but yeah. it's a rodeo. If you face right. it, it's a rodeo. It I think I think I think it's important to put it on a lawn that you're familiar with. Yes. So that you can compare it against the machine that you're using now, yep. right? So like like mm -hmm. like on a hill, you might want to try a mower on a hill to see. I've got a property that the hill's a little sketchy. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yep. You know, so that right with the with the with the dual dually wheels in the back probably would be. It would bite. Yeah, it would be bite. It'd be very nice. <laughs> we but, all have that, we all have that one property where we've had the most different pieces of equipment on it. We really kind of we know everything about the property. We know exactly how long it takes, and, and that's the property that you want to demo. No, no, no. Uh, I agree. So, like when I got a demo last year and. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to use their name, even though you're in here. I've demoed an X Mark 60 inch. Yep. Uh, he loved it. <laughs> I loved it. But like you said, I only had it for a day, yep. uh, you know, and I was happy to get it for the entire day. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, it was a nice mower. Uh, but like you said, there's so much, there was another guy waiting for me for it when I dropped it off that night. Yep. So, so they're going in and out constantly. It seems like. Especially in the peak of spring. Will there be a generation two intensity? Good question. Um, I would say not in the near, near term because in part because the intensity is a rock solid machine. Um, and the other thing is that with the small standard B, the 32 and 36 inch standard B, it kind of adds to that range. The intensity is very much a heavy duty machine with the air cleaners and thick metal and the standard B is a little bit lighter, way more affordable, still commercial. And so I think in that 32, 36 inch class, um, we're, that that kind of addresses what could have been a Gen 2 intensity. But you also find that they're, they're the intense, so recognize that the intensity is almost like a Gen 2 standard R8. We renamed it when we came out with the intensity. Um, so at some level already a second generation product um but yeah probably not in the near near future okay uh here's one from angel Campman. he says it seems some of the complaints with the standards keep coming not being able to feather the deck over the roots faster ground speed you know like you can do on a, on a uh, sit down zero turn you can push that pedal and feather the deck yeah yep. that's one of the downsides uh we've done a few things to try to you know, address countermeasures to it. Uh, some of our early machines, you really had to lift on the deck handle with a lot of force. Now, most of them have a button and they have a lot more spring force in them. So the button keeps the deck from jumping up and down. Um, but once you press the button, it, you can lift them pretty easily. So with the technique, you can drive with one hand and float over. I know it's not as easy if you're sitting in a seat. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Mr. G just got here. He says he sure missed a lot. But sorry, Mr. G. Up, when this live stream's over, uh, I'm going to leave this video up so you can go back and watch the beginning if you want. So let's see what's going on. Here we go. Billy Goat wants to know: Is the plant in Frederick open for tours? Absolutely. If you reach out to us on our website and try to set up a time, we'll see what we can do. And uh, we do tours all the time. Love to do it. He'd also want. He'd also like a chance to meet Ed. So. Yeah. So typically a tour, it's about 45 minutes walking through the shop and um, I probably do 90% of them. So by all means, uh, you're welcome to try to set up a time. And You, you do 90% of the tours? Yep. Are you kidding me? Nope. That's, Most people who come all that distance, they, they, they want to they meet me. Yeah, so, well, um, of course. I you're, do what I can. You're the face of the company now, you know what I mean? Uh, that's that's impressive to me. I think that that's, you know, there's, there's leaders, there's leaders and then there's managers, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's a leadership, that's a leadership move. And I think that that's why you've got such a, a following, you know, people are mm -hmm. like very loyal to the right brand. And I think, I think this, this explains a lot of that right here on this one. So well, it's, it's not, it's not, um, you know, I'm not trying to sell one person, one mower. You know, so many people, they, they check us out and say, hey, this is not for me, or it is for me. If it is for me, then they go on and tell other people, hey, I bought this mower. I'm happy with it. Referrals. Um, even if they didn't buy it, they go on and tell other people, hey, I toured that place. It was pretty cool. Uh, sometimes we work with somebody that ends up, you know, buying 100 units and, you know, 20 more every year. You know, so you just never know who the angel in disguise will be. And, and um, you know, I try to treat everybody with the same level of uh, opportunity. Yep. So Lawn Stars, you know those guys, Ed. Yep. They they call you Ted, I think, on their show. Are, are any of your siblings involved? You got you got nine brothers and sisters. Are any yep. of those guys involved? And and what what roles do they play in the company? My my parents didn't didn't do anything to try to pressure anyone into the business, and um, pretty much everyone else has find found different careers that they've been happy with. And except, with the exception of my next younger brother, he's um, he's our VP of manufacturing. So there's two of us in the business. Oh, nice. So, okay. So uh, we were talking about mowers a little bit, standard mowers. Mm -hmm. you, you guys came out with you guys came out with the 32B. Can you can you discuss can you discuss the 32B a little bit? And, and why, I I know why I think you guys came out with it. <laughs> Uh, but maybe it'd be better coming from you. Sure. So there's a couple different reasons. I mean, apart from the B, most of our mowers are seven thousand dollars and more, and that's that's a lot to pay for a machine that you're going to use intermittently, or if you're getting in the business. And so uh, the, the standard B, what it is, is trying to make as commercial a mower as possible while trying to be at a more affordable price point. And so we have an integrated transmission in there. We have the Kawasaki FS series engine, so it doesn't have the big canister on the top. So a few things take a lot of the cost out of it, but it still has a solid warranty, and it's still very serviceable. So if you you know keep keep uh, repairs, there's no reason you can't run it for a long, long time. Um, and so I, I mentioned there are kind of two different things. One is low utilization. So if you're working in a backyard, you're not going to put 1,200 hours on a machine. Just you know between driving between lots of smaller properties, uh, you don't need as heavy duty as a mower as, as someone who's doing larger properties. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, like like when you got started, you, you used, uh, you know, your John Deere and you started building cash flow. You said, hey, this is something I really want to get into. And you start building the scale up and you, you know, a lot of people, they start with a used walk behind and that's a great recommendation. Yeah. And, um, you know, get the cash flow going and the cash flow from that first unit is oftentimes what's going to go through paint towards the payment on other equipment down the road. And so, you know, as you get going, you're not going to go buy a $10,000 lawnmower the first day. And but you might be able to buy a standard B and really generate the production that you need to be profitable. And so that's that's what we're targeting with that machine. Wow. OK. All right. So. Speaking of first generation, our right, our new mo or our first mower they bought new and they still use it today. I wonder how many hours is, is on that mower. What's the most amount of hours you've ever seen on one of your mowers, Ed? Most amount of hours, 
I saw, well, sometimes it's hard to tell because if, if, a, if the ignition key gets kept on too many times and the hour meter keeps accumulating. Yeah. But I think 12,000 hours was the, was the most legitimate hours that I saw on, on one, uh, it was a small, small fixed stack standard. That's and um, That's before an engine change? I think it was on a second engine. Second engine. I don't have the records to prove it, but okay. you know, the average engine is going to be 2,000 hours. And if you really nurse it, you might get three or four. That's what but, I was. But, but 12 yeah. is not going to happen. <laughs> I was going to say, man, that guy, that guy got to get super lucky in the, in the lemon lottery. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't get one. He didn't get 11. There's uh, a ton of RHs that are still out there. And, um, you know, if you keep maintaining them, there's no reason to keep running them. No, that's right. Why well, TV? I think we just answered that, uh, the cost effective for the low budget consumer. That's where the 32B makes its, its, its uh, entry into, into, the, into the lineup, right? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it low budget. I would say it budget commercial, but budget. Not, not consumer. The consumer business is completely different. I mean, it's right. the difference between making Mack trucks and smart cars. I mean, in, in a, I just don't, I don't think we're positioned from a production standpoint, from a dealer standpoint. Uh, and I think it would take from our ability to focus on on uh, commercial landscapers with the level of attention that we need if we were selling residential equipment. Right. Uh, we were going to ask this at the end, Cato. Uh, yeah. Any new products coming in the near future? And we're going to ask Ed at the end. And if we forget to ask you, Ed, maybe you can volunteer that information for for, uh, for us at the end. But uh, Mr. G wants to know what do you what do you think about Ballard Incorporated add on seat to what do you think about the add-on products that they're making for your motors? Yeah, it's good. It's, uh, it's a good way to help us sell more machines. Um, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. For years, we've had people saying, hey, we need to put a, put a hitch receiver in the back of our stand-on mowers. Because mm -hmm. today we make our stand-ons, and then on the other hand, we have these sport mowers. And the handlebars are a little bit lower, and there's kind of a motor seat, motorcycle seat off the back of it. Right. And, um, and so people have said, hey, you know, I would like to switch between two on the same property and if you gave us a hit receiver on the back, we could, you know, pop a seat in there. Um, so I've, I've always thought that was a good idea, but we never, we never ran. With it. So it's neat to see them going for it. And, um, and uh, actually one of our dealers is involved with it as well. So um, I think, I think they're doing a neat job with it. Let's see, see where it goes. There you go. Myra would like you to speak on the 32 inch floating decks. Yeah, so the 32, 36, small b, um, the 32 and 36 are identical except for the tires on the 32 are a little bit narrower and the deck is a little bit narrower. Um, and the deck, boy, if I could remember what the range is, I want to say it's one and a half to five or five and a quarter. Mm -hmm. um, and it floats a little tilt and all that stuff. Um, we have a fixed, in 32, if you don't buy a B, you have to buy a fixed deck. So when we came out with the B, it was the first time we had a floating deck 32. Uh, you can't buy that with an intensity. Right. So it's my understanding that you that you had something to do with the patent when it comes to those floating decks. Is that true? When you were an engineer? Yeah. So there was 30 or more patents around all different aspects of standing between the wheels themselves, which was before I was involved. Uh, but a lot of other patents about the execution of what makes up a stand-on mower. And um, and yes, I've been involved in a bunch of that. I looked up a bunch of you guys' patents, honestly, uh, to prepare myself for talking with you. And I couldn't believe how many times your name came up. You've, yeah. been, you've been really involved in this company for a really long time from, from all aspects. And that's just that's super impressive to me, man. It is very impressive. Do you know, yeah. Ed, something that I've wanted to discuss with someone i've got a great idea what's that about oh. adding a something she to a mower she does i'm gonna let you i'm gonna let her talk to you offline about it okay. it's an idea yeah i'm always open to ideas i don't want to give anybody else it because we know your competitors are watching that yeah. we don't want to give them any ideas right i you know i've, I've mentioned this before but no one's mm -hmm. ever like reached out and asked what's your idea kh yeah. gosh yes well it's let me know it's a great idea. It is. Uh, Premier Lawn Care from Florida wants to know: Are you a Ravens fan? You know, I don't. I don't really pay attention that much. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just didn't grow up that involved in sports. Do you know what and, I mean? Uh, or watching that you fly? Mm. Yes. 
Yeah. Oh my gosh, that is so cool. That plane that you were pictured with, that was Piper, wasn't it? Yeah, so um, in terms of flying, I, I, there's no, I don't have any background in it, but a couple years ago, I was like, this is something I really want to do. Um, one of my customers has a, has a plane and uh, a friend of my wife's has a plane that took me up a couple of times. And I was just fascinated with it. And um, I was looking for something that would challenge me, um, you know, as a skill, also intellectually, and also something just to get my, my mind in a, different, in a different setting, right? So I started taking flight lessons and uh, it, was, it was a blast. It's been two, two and a half years, I guess. And uh, I rent here at the Frederick Airport. And um, sometimes I fly PA-28, which would have been the low wing plane. Yeah. Or, uh, or a Cessna 172, uh, which is a good, Cessna, good sturdy flyer. The Cessnas have less than, it's uh, less than 12,500 maximum takeoff weight. <laughs> yes, sir. My, my wife works for the FAA. She she, oh, really? hires, she hires air traffic controllers. She's okay. in HR, so she, she knows a little bit about aviation. Enough okay. to be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, she's been hanging out with me for <laughs> about 35 years. And I have been in, asking for operating initials and finally got them. She finally, so this, this, is, this, is a, this is a great place to fly. Frederick is yeah. right between the Frederick Airport's right before between Camp David and the DCSFRA. And we've got Class Bravo, Class Charlie. It, yeah, it's a it's a great place to learn to fly. I bet they shut down that airspace a couple of days ago when all that stuff was going on. Yeah, uh, not not for that, but they do they do shut it down. Yeah. Or uh, you know, I've I've been up in the traffic pattern when uh, Trump flies through the the Frederick airspace on, the, on his way up there. It's yeah, fun. Sometimes they land there. Um, is it what Marine One? Is that the helicopter? Marine One. Yeah, they'll they'll stage that at the Frederick Airport. Awesome. Yeah, Air Force One is their is the is the big jumbo jet. Yeah. Uh, Moosey Mo and friends of ours from Arkansas. Moosey Mo and Amore actually, they sent us T-shirts and stuff. They're real nice folks. Heck yeah. <laughs> We're gonna go visit them uh, hopefully next month. He wants to know, do you have any intentions to create a side bagging system like Skag or the Toro? Uh, I won't be too specific, but I can say I'm keeping a real keen eye on it. And that might be the end of the show question that my, you might bring it up, right? Yeah. Okay. That's good. Cool. Stick around for that. You might want to hear about that. Um, Let's see what else we got. Guy, I'm, yeah. uh, these questions, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm so bad at the comments. It's hard because we don't, we have to look over here when we're trying yeah. to look at the camera. Yeah. And be uh, interactive. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hey, guys, I tried to turn off the, uh, I tried to turn off the super chats. I'd appreciate it if you didn't super chat. Oh, no. I was trying to I was trying to figure it out earlier with with Ed here, but we couldn't figure out how to do it. I know that I'm missing a bunch of questions, so I'm going to go back up here. Where was I? In the meantime, let me just say that Moosey Mowing yes. sent me a shirt that says it's a lawn care thing, Moosey Mowing, because mm -hmm. he saw my it's a hippie thing. <laughs> you wouldn't understand. And I think he made me a special T-shirt. I feel special. <laughs> good, good. So, <laughs> so Ryan, I guess is uh, one of your right dealers down there in Louis, yep. Louisville, Kentucky. Yep, that's a good place to be, especially, yeah. especially in October. Uh -huh. Yep. <laughs> Ryan and Stacy, they they they're doing a great job with us, and uh, really glad to have them on board. Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. You know, when I went to the GI, I didn't go last year, but we went the year before. And I think I actually shook your hand. I, mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know who you were, honestly, because I was brand new in the business. Yeah. And I know you didn't know who I was. But I think we shook hands. But I found it incredible when we were walking, when my son and I were walking around the thing, the right, the area around right is always busy. Yeah. You know, always. Uh, and I found that to be really impressive. Uh, and it's because the CEO is standing right out there. I don't think any of the other CEOs were standing outside there, you know, talking about their stuff. I thought that was really cool. It's, it, I tell you what, honestly, the show is pretty, a pretty exhausting thing. It's usually by the time I go home, I'm sick and I've got a sore throat and probably caught like six different varieties of the cold. Oh, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. But it's fun. It's, it's like a reunion to see everyone but have a great time with it. Hand sanitizer yeah. 
we were on a cru- we were on a cruise during we used last sanit- sanitizer constant. Yeah, but that's why we missed the GIE. So yeah, we're not doing that again. No, I can promise I'm you. sorry. I- Expensive Gardens from England would like to know uh, what company you'd recommend for his first commercial mower ad. I've well, you can buy you can buy a right mower in the UK, so yeah. that, that's one option. So uh, it's it's such a specific question to the type of um, lawns that he's cutting. Yeah, and um, and also realize in the UK, like they don't mow exactly the way we do here. That's right. Um, there's small areas which are cut much more nicely. They they kind of a bigger distinction between fine cut grass and rough cut grass and whatnot. Um, so it's a it's a broad question to answer, and I'm. I couldn't tell them exactly what to get. I'll go ahead and I'll take the liberty of answering that for you. Uh, you should probably go with Wright Extensive Gardens. So, Heck yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I'd do. Cato says the 32B is a great stand on for any individual looking for an upgrade. There you go. Yep, yep. So I, I know that he's, he's used one and I know that Stets uh, demoed one as well. Yep. yep. In fact, I think he didn't didn't step by one a thirty two B. I think he's he's got one on his in his fleet or something. Uh, no, Rich, wants to know, Rich wants to know what your built in life expectancy on your machines are. That's great question. It, it depends on who's using it, you know, and where and where you're using it, right? So, like in Oklahoma, we don't we don't have too many rust issues here, so cars last forever here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, they don't rust out, but. Yeah. Uh, if you, you know, you go up north somewhere, you can rust out a machine pretty quick. I, wouldn't you agree that it would depend on how you're using it and where you're using it? It would. It would. I'd say it's kind of break the question down a little bit is that you find a, a lot of manufacturers try to make a machine that will last the life of the first engine. You know, the, the piston cylinder aspect of things and lubricating it, that has kind of a fixed life and nobody's figured out how to get it to last longer. And so... Most people tend to build machines around that 2,000 hour limit. I definitely believe that there's no reason why a mower that costs 9,000 or more, hydro shouldn't last two engines and the frame shouldn't last. Two. And repowering is part of the life cycle. Now the first owner may not be the one who's putting that second engine in it, but if we're building a, a base machine that can outlast two to three units, then when you go to sell your mower or trade your mower in, it's gonna have higher residual um, even if it needs a second engine. So four, 6,000 hours, somewhere in that range. Mm. There you go. Myra says you, your grass catchers need a new design, but I think Myra needs to be a little bit more specific. Maybe a little, maybe a little user input. Uh, I've heard comments that they would like a, a handle where it's kind of right over the center of gravity a little bit more. Is that what you want, Myra, easier to that what you're talking about? Just a redesign on the... Or are you looking for something different? Uh, Red Rock Maintenance, he's he's my friend in Canada. He wants to know what your best selling machine is. Yeah, it, it changes every year with ebbs and flows of the market. But I think the thing that's happening right now is that good help, good help is hard to find. And that is a major issue for our industry, major, major issue for our industry. Yeah. And so what's that? What It's caused um, a lot of people to buy bigger, more powerful, more productive machines. And uh, for us, for us, that means the standard ZK is um, is, is one of our strong sellers. Uh, Rich, I guess lives in Canada. He wants to know. You've already answered this question probably for the United States, but what about Canada? Are you expanding in Canada as well, or? We are. A previous distributor that was covering that range area retired a couple of years ago, and the distributor we're working with up there now is building out that area larger and larger. Um, Rich, feel free to reach out to us and, and we can connect you with the distributor so they know where you are. And you know. One thing, if somebody says, hey, I have no dealer near me, the best thing you can do is reach out to us and say, this is what I'm interested in, this is where I'm at, and so-and-so is the best dealer in town. That kind of information is really valuable to us and, and we can uh, follow up to better understand what's going on in your area. And that leads into this, that, that takes care of this question as well. You can get on their website and you can do a dealer locator on their website. Yep. And it's, uh, you just Google, you know, right mowers or right manufacturer, you know, come right up top thing. Yep. So you can just go there and you can find the closest dealer to you. You'll get like a Google map within our website with all the, the uh, dealer flags on it. Yeah. Long commander says he's watching KH. What Hi, I- Long commander. 
when I watch when I watch this back, which I will, I'll watch her too. Make sure she's not doing the old. <laughs> I don't do that. I pay attention. So mm -hmm. I know you. I know that you saw that photo of mm -hmm. Judith standing in front of that C-17 down yeah. at Office Air Force Base, and and Eric from Caddo says if you're still more than welcome to come down to Altus for a tour of the C-17. Caddo. I want to come to Altus to do a tour of the C-17. I, I do, too. So, but I was stationed there for four years. Yeah, I was an air traffic controller down there. But I'd be more interested in you being able to get us into that C-17 simulator. Heck, yes. I oh. think that'd, that'd be fun. You that know, I, I went into one simulator one time, and I sucked at it. I crashed the plane right away. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm I'm too all over the place. I'm like, shiny penny. Oh, shiny penny. Yeah. Shiny penny. I have a video of her learning how to use the standard. It was really nerve wracking. <laughs> I have a I have a, a simulator on my home computer that uh, I used to. I I've tried flying a number of instrument approaches to kind of get a feel for it a little bit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that that used to be my job designing those instrument approaches that that everybody flies. There's a lot to it. I I did my my groundwork on in, on an instrument, mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't think I have I, I have to do it again. It's getting a lot going over my head. They're getting rid of a lot of their ground based stuff. Like we we've gotten rid of a lot of NDB procedures this year, mm. uh, and and we're replacing it all with the RMP and and the RNAV uh, GPS approaches. Yep. So it's a really interesting time in aviation because basically the airplane can fly themselves now. I mean, if well, you know. With the uh, ADS-B, that's really going to change the game eventually, I think. Yeah, yeah. So it really is next gen. I mean, we talk about next gen. We've been yeah. talking about that in my business for years, but it really is making the leap to that next gen now. So, Ed, I have a question. Yeah. There are flying cars now. Would you ever purchase one? So you never know, <laughs> Ed. You never know what you're going to get in a in a Acme live stream. <laughs> I think I, I forget where I saw the question. It might may have been on, on one of our pages before this meeting or something. Anyways, um, someone was asking if we would make uh, a tour of multi-force. And, you know, it's not to say that we wouldn't ever make a tour, tour, multi, tour of multi-force, but there is a thing that happens when you try to make one product that does one thing really well do two things, and you kind of dilute it. It's now good at neither. And I think that's definitely the case with the flying car. There, yeah. Okay. It's, it's kind of tends to too many compromises. I've been married to this guy too long. I watch all kinds of tech stuff so I can prepare myself for what he's going to buy. Because <laughs> I do. I do. I'm he terrible. Does. I love my toys. I love he the does. tech toys. So. Yep. Hey, Billy Goat wants to know, uh, between the stand-on mowers and your walk-behinds and zero turns, what's, what's your top sellers among that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean... In terms of the entire industry, there's probably 30% more stand-on mowers sold than walk-behinds. Yeah. Within our brand, you know, it's, I don't know, 20 to 1 or something like the 30 to 1. And, 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 um, and actually, last year, we discontinued our gear drive walk-behinds. I kind of had to shed a tear when I, when I made that decision. But what changed my mind on it was I realized that I couldn't, in good conscience, recommend somebody buy a gear drive lawnmower anymore. When we had the standard B, yeah. you, look, you look at what you pay and then the amount of production you're going to get from it. I, if you go on our channel, I have a YouTube video. I break this all down, but it's a losing proposition. The productivity you get with a zero turn standard B type machine or honestly, or a time cutter, if you're going to start off doing four lawns, um, you know, you're way better off than, than buying a gear drive machine. Now, the, the hydro walk behinds when you're doing a really steep hill and you don't want to rip up the grass and that kind of thing. There's a place for them, um, but it's not going to necessarily increase your revenue. Right. Would you say that you, you, you and you'd stand behind that between the zero turns too, right? Way more standards than zero turns that you're selling. The sit down. Oh, for us, absolutely. Yep. Now, as an industry, there's a lot more riders, but yeah. Um, but, we, but for your particular company. Yep. We sell a nice little number of Z's and they're real solid, but it's, the main event is our stand on mowers. Uh, Cato says he can do that. Uh, he can get us in the simulator. Heck yes! I love it. I'd I'll crash right away, but you know. 
I think we should ask uh, Cato to make that happen. Ed. I, Heck yeah. See, I'm, I'm leveraging you right now. <laughs> you should do it for Ed and then invite me along too. Yes. So let's see what else we got here. Uh, if you've asked a question and we've missed it, I'm sorry. I'm terrible at the comments. Ask it again and we'll ask Ed. Uh, but there was there was a question asked earlier, uh, and it was from Eric from Cato, and he says, "What's next for Wright? What's is there anything on the future in the future horizon you could talk about tonight?" Yeah. So I mean, when we have a when we have one product replacing something else, whatever we got product in the pipeline, it can't be super specific. But let me start by just kind of describing some of the things that are driving our industry. One of the most popular questions I get is, "When are we going to have electric mower?" and there will be a day for that. The thing about it right now is that, like our ZK, can have one of our top selling machines holds 16 and a half gallons of gas and 37 horsepower. To get that equivalent performance, you'd need two Tesla Model X batteries on that mower. That would weigh 4,000 pounds. So, so people right now, they need productivity because there's not enough people out there and there's more work than you can do and yeah. all that, right? now. You bring electric piece of equipment on the job and it's weaker, you know, doesn't necessarily cut as well at the same. If you go slowly, it cuts well, but not at the same speeds. And halfway through the day or two thirds of the way through the day, the battery starts getting weak and it's going to take 10 hours to recharge it. You know, so from a practical standpoint, we're not there yet. Two Tesla Model X batteries is probably 50 grand. Um, now, right now, I think the, the the uh, Bloomberg numbers for batteries are something like $110 a kilowatt hour. I think when it, it's going down quickly, but I think when batteries get to $80, $70, $60 a kilowatt hour, uh, that'll start happening real quick. And certainly there's going to be a day as we're looking uh, towards to, uh, to bring a product like that to market. But it's a matter of when's, when's, when's the technology and the economic pull for it all match up. Yeah. It'll be interesting. I mean, we'd all like to get rid of the complexities of um, internal combustion engines, but yeah. um, whoever figures that one out, yeah, they're going to be rich. Well, they're figuring it out. I mean, when they we, are, yeah. When, yeah. when we first started replacing, uh, you know, well, supplementing our power grid with wind turbines, mm -hmm. that wasn't very effective either at the beginning. Right. But because we we got our, our foot in the game and we got that first yep. one up, that gave us a platform to improve upon. Yeah. So yep. over the years, those things are improving and improving and improving, and they, they're pretty soon they're going to be able to sustain sustain us without the yep. hole in the wall. You know, if if they weren't so ugly, I'd put one in my backyard. What a wind turbine? Yes. <laughs> okay. We get a lot of energy. We would. <laughs> the wind blows here constantly. Yeah. That's Oklahoma. Uh, Jay's wants to know if you got any dealers coming to Louisiana. You don't have any dealers in Louisiana? I want to say we do have some activity down there, but I don't know exactly who it would be. Yeah. Um, second part of his question, we're going to adapt oil guard system. So the oil guard system is uh, the Briggs Vanguard 500-hour oil change. The separate tank takes the oil out of the engine. Um, I think right now my, my feelings on that is it's great that you don't have to change the oil for a long time. And generally you're never going to run it out of oil so it won't seize up you know if it's in a fleet situation or something like that um i really wish that the oil was staying in the engine or at least half the oil um and not all of it but uh, i i think there's a place where we'll put that on a product uh here in the future are you are you gonna here's a question from rich again are you expanding into other areas you're going to be doing like add-ons and, and like racks and trimmers and stuff like that with right I'd love to, but the thing is my product line pipeline is too many ideas, not enough capacity to execute it. And, it. and I want to hold quality first. I don't want to just push a bunch of stuff out that's like me. That's right. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I, would, I would love to expand the accessory side of things. And our, our aim is to help our dealers and our landscape customers be more successful. Yeah. And if that means an accessory, it means this or that or the other thing, I'm all up for, for creating it. My buddy Mike from Get It Done with a Gun is asking about the battery technology. I think this interests a lot of us because I think we all see it coming. And he says, you know, it could change the industry if the price point yeah. is on point. And that's true. 
but like you said earlier, there's, you have to make it through the entire day first and it has yep. to be, you have to be, be, be able to make money with these machines. Otherwise they're not going to sell. If, if we bring Tesla back into it as now an analogy, there's a lot of companies that were making electric cars before Tesla, yeah. but they all were, you know, commuting within a small city kind of a situation, not highway driving and certainly not performance. And, and Tesla said, hey, we're going to make a supercar. It's going to be expensive and people are going to love it. It's going to have a ginormous screen in it, right? Yeah. So it's got to be good, got to be better almost before it becomes uh, something that people are want to want to buy. Wesley Thomas wants you to explain the 12% off the starter fleet process, pricing. Yep. So for commercial. So just like um, a lot of retail, you've got, you know, the MSRP, it's kind of the basis price or you go buy a car, there's an MSRP, whatnot. And then there's different rebate structures that get to a retail price. And so we'll change pricing at different times. And what we do is we change a rebate that goes to the dealer so we don't devalue or mess up their inventory. Um, and so there's there's a rebate structure behind the scenes that brings the price approximately to that 12% level. Um, dealers that are like in California or some really far away place where it costs $600 to ship the machine there, they're probably going to be a little bit over that 12%. Um, but 12% is just the adjustment off the MSRP that we're running at this time. And actually, it used to be our fleet price. You used to have to buy like 10 mowers to get that price. But as we started growing and building more and more machines, uh, we were able to, to bring that fleet price across the board. Uh, Scout just wants a general information question. He's looking to pick up a super low hour 42 inch RH. Can can you tell him what the difference in that mower and the current standard uh, intensity is? Yeah, so it's going to have pretty similar pumps and wheel motors and um, running gear like that. The biggest thing is that um, the intensity has a suspension platform and also the intensity the deck can tilt hanging on chains. The RH is adjustable, but once it's in its adjustment position, the deck is locked in. A um, couple other features, just you know, a, a little bit smoother um, with the standard intensity. But that those are the core differences. Same same running gear. So you guys got a lot of. I mean, the competition's pretty strong in the in the commercial yep. industry, right? In Black Black Fork, uh, Jesse uh, is his name. He's Black Fork Lawn and Snow. He's a new guy this year too. Uh, just starting up, just like we did a couple of years ago. He's asking about the merger between Cub Cadet. Jesse's awesome. He is way. really cool. If you haven't checked him out, you ought to. Yeah. But he's asking, do you think that, that Cub Cadet's going to be a player now? Does it look like they're going to make a run? or? I, I just, from a very broad standpoint, it's very hard for companies that are very big and in the middle of really kind of a major sweeping change to – successfully pull something like that off. I mean, maybe they'll be wildly success successful or maybe it won't gain traction. And, and I just don't know. I'm at this point, not totally sure that Black & Decker understands the plight that you deal with every day mm. when the equipment breaks down. You know, have, have, have they gotten their fingers greasy? Do they really understand this? I don't know. And so to me, the, the jury's out. Am I concerned about it? I think that there's enough business to go around. And so I think from our standpoint, um, I try not to spend a lot of time thinking about our competitors. I try to spend a lot of time thinking about our customers. And if and we're I, doing that right, it'll it'll work out for us. And I think yeah. that I think every successful business owner does that. They they're not too concerned. Their only competition is themselves. Yep. So, you know, if we can't beat that guy, then then there's something wrong, right? Right. Yep. So, yeah. Uh there was something else here. Oh, yeah. They were asking about, uh, see, I use, uh, in Oklahoma, we're able to get non-ethanol additive gas. And I use, I use the, we call it real gas. I yeah, use real gas. As 100%. Good stuff. 100% as yeah, much as right. I can. Yeah. Because that ethanol can really tear up some stuff. And Angel Campman, he asked a question before. He's asking if the technology and engine uh, in the future development of engines are combating that ethanol problem that everybody's having. Yeah, so um, generally EFI engines are going to handle ethanol way better because the fuel's not open to the atmosphere. It's the field system and under pressure. Um, 
that's the biggest thing. The second thing is that realistically in a lawnmower, the two cycle equipment's entirely different. I'm not gonna speak to that, but in a four cycle uh, lawnmower, it's being used commercially. Ethanol really shouldn't be a big concern as long as you don't let it sit over winter. Run the carburetor dry, you know, shut off, empty the fuel out, run it dry, and you really shouldn't have ethanol problems. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, there is some work being done around biobutanol, which is a little bit different chemical change than ethanol, and it doesn't have the bad side effects as, as ethanol. So if more of that's being used as the um, renewable component to what's getting mixed in the gas, it would help everybody, especially two sites. Yeah. Well, can you believe that we've been going? It's it's almost seven twenty. Oh man. We like to we like to wrap them up in about an hour and a half. So let's talk about uh, that question that was asked earlier about what's on the horizon, what's new, what's what's brand new coming. I want to hear the big thing because I know you're holding. Well, well, I'm going to hold back on you, you know, in terms of this product and when. Um, but I think you're going to see, you know, more powerful product, products that help um, to be more productive. We talked about labor before. Labor is really driving what's going on here. And so there's a lot of people that saying, you know, they get offers to bid work and they're just like, I'm not going to bid it because I don't have the people to do it. So we're making equipment that helps people uh, take on the additional work without burning extra calories. And um couple techniques to do that and uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes out in the next year or two in the broad sense. Uh, I'm also working more kind of at at a strategy level of, um, you know, I I think if we run our business, think in our minds, thinking of it as a co-op, you know, it's, it's, it's a, we're a manufacturer, you know, by the people for the people, we really hold our customers' interests first. Um, What kinds of decisions do we make? And um, and trying to bring that that as part of our driving force, uh, so that has its impact at, at different levels and systems and services that that go along with our product. So some things like that. That's amazing. Hmm. Can't wait to see what it is. It'll be what? neat. Landscape. I, I can't wait to see what you've got coming that you're not mentioning. I'm looking forward to it too. <laughs> uh, but there there was. I the- saw a little indiscreet message there There's you're not spot. giving it away oh well, you have you have you have to tell me what your idea is and then uh oh, we yeah. Will be it. well yeah well, so i'll let you i'll let her tell you yeah but, but not but not here no <laughs> she'll let she'll let you know yeah so landscapes of america i think he's asked this twice call in after this and we'll where discuss it. where did ever ride mowers come from that he said they look exactly like right mowers yeah they're very similar in color and they were building a variant to that original stand on I was talking about where the platform was further in front of the wheels. Um, and they, I, I think they ran into some financial issues and they sold it out to, I think, um, I think Dan Arians bought them some, some years ago, a long time ago. Mm. Uh, so if you go on the website, they, there's still some manuals and that kind of thing, but the product lines have been tilled into the Bravely product line. We got time for a couple more questions, guys. So if you if you want to ask Ed a question, we got a couple more minutes. I told him I wouldn't keep him all night because he's got five kids. I, yeah. bet his, I bet his wife would like a little help this evening. We got about eight more. Probably all asleep by now. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> lucky for well, I mean, what what a nice day for you. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, extensive gardens was asking if there's any plans for a right mower engine. Are you planning on building your own engine, or are you still going to subcontract it out to Kawasaki and Kohler? Yeah, you know, I've I've asked myself that at some moments of frustration. Um, you know, if, if we had an engine, we could support it the, at the standard that we want to support it to. Um, and you know, I'm I have a very practical approach at look how, how I look at things. And um, you know, I, I'd like engines that have bigger bolts that don't strip out and less parts and easier to fix. And, but I think the reality is it's such a different sector that I. I would be taken away from the mower side if I put too much yeah. attention into it. Yeah, totally it, get it. it. Takes millions and millions of dollars. Chris from Blind TV wanted to uh, tell you hi, Ed. Hey, Chris, good to hear from you again. So, uh, Ben Ben Backwood said it was a good interview, a good a good job, gentlemen, and thank you for keeping the boys in line, K. <laughs> Thanks, it was fun. 
I was actually trying to keep myself in line. <laughs> that that's the real challenge. Oh yes. Yeah, that's the real challenge. But anyway, and I really appreciate you spending time with us tonight and talking about it. I was super excited when you said you were going to do it. And I loved the history. Thank you. It was great. So much. Definitely not disappointing. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Sure thing. Uh, and if you have anything in closing that you'd like to announce or talk about, then please do so. We've, I mean, we can go the rest of the night if you want, but uh, <laughs> seven more minutes is what I was planning on. Well, I, I don't, I don't have anything necessarily prepared. I just, I appreciate the opportunity. I, I enjoy this time. And, um, you know, I, this, this notion of a landscape community and people define it different ways. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. I, I enjoy this time and um, y'all see, see me out there. So, uh, you, you can find me on Facebook or Instagram or occasionally when I get around to it, a YouTube video. Uh, maybe encourage me to do more. I don't know. I would love, oh. I'd love to see that. Heck yeah. Yeah. I, we watch I, YouTube constantly. We, I watch I, it all the time. I'm a reality so, so, chick. I love watching reality shows. But I have held off. Like Bravo TV is my favorite. I have stopped watching so many mm -hmm shows on regular TV and started watching YouTube videos. It's better and you can pick what, you know, what you're more interested. In. So here's one of the, here's one of the ideas we had to, for, for uh, something we could run as a series on YouTube. Um, you know, as a manufacturer, we're passionate about efficiency. We have so many things down to the seconds, like, yeah. you know, just that's, that's the production environment. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something that I'm passionate about. But creating a series where you know we we go cut a lawn, and then uh, the next week we tweak a few things to improve how quickly we can cut it. You know, in terms of the flow and the sequencing, and there's actually a lot to it. You know, do you start in the front right corner or the front left corner, or you park here? Or, you know, what's your first step and your last step? And if you're working with two people or three people, that flow is completely different. Yeah. And on a 15 minute property, you know, two minutes is. It's, two minutes seems like a small amount of time, but if you can take two minutes out of every job and you're doing it, you know, by not just rushing or burning more calories, that means you can do, you know, one or two more lawns at the end of the day. You're that's more pure even. profit. Yeah. Efficiently, yeah. Yeah. And that, so we can do a series where we're refining it. And I know that there's so many people that have great ideas and it could be kind of a contributor thing as well. That was a thought. That's, awesome. That's where I make, that's where I make my, uh, you know, balance my, for my business is, is, is in the efficiency. Yeah. So, and you start with a lawn, the first time it takes you an hour to do by the end of yep. the season, you're doing that same exact lawn in 25 minutes. Yep, exactly. Well, because the first time you do it, you've got to make sure it's perfect. Yeah. Well, you gotta, and well, then you gotta learn you, it. You have a lawn, you've got <laughs> the, the base and then you can go from there and it doesn't take very much time. So, I mean, part of it is this, is the reality is that on the lawn that you cut, you know where every hidden yeah. gopher hole is, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, you get the, you get the hang of it and you know, yeah. your properties like the back of your hand, you know what your cut patterns are going to be, you know, who starts where and who ends where you get a group. And, and the people that think that this industry is going to move to an Uber platform and you just order a cut this week and anybody's going to show up and do it. Uh -uh. Yeah. No. <laughs> This industry is solidly a consistent customer that you have. And at some level, there's a relationship between the provider and the property owner. And that confidence is really important. I just want to say one thing real quick. And that is that we've got a returning customer already for this next year. They emailed us. It's a horse farm that Ben does. Oh, yeah. I was, well, a lot of my customers have already contacted me about yeah. coming back, but that was, yeah. the, that was the one that I was worried. It's always nice getting those calls. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. today has been a perfect, perfect day. And yeah. you helped make that possible. I appreciate Good. it. Tonight. Good. All right. So Here's Flo it. Dizzle wants to know in closing, Ed, do you accept the dance challenge? I don't know what he's talking about. You know what he's talking about? Uh, I don't know what he's talking about either. Sorry. Money I'm out of the loop on something. Okay. So it's money making Mike G. He has a dance challenge. And I've participated in it on my channel. Okay. I don't know, I don't know if that's what Float's talking about. Oh, though, but, okay. But maybe, maybe you can uh, Instagram on Float and see if he'll yep. do it. 
Okay. I'm out there. Shoot me a message. I love you, Dan. <laughs> but but Ed, thank you very much for joining thank us you tonight. So much. Yep. And uh, we're gonna let you get back to your to your kids. I can't thank tell you. you how how awesome it was talking to you tonight. Heck yeah. I wish you and your company the best uh, for 2020. Yep. And I can't wait to see you at GIE this year. Yep. Looking forward to it. Uh, I'm warning you, I'm a hugger. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> we'll see you, Ed. Thank you so yep. much for your time. Sure Bye thing. Now. Yep. See you guys later. Bye.